ChatGPT4, the latest AI language model, is taking the world by storm. With its complex algorithms, it generates responses so human-like that you'll start wondering if you're talking to a real person or a machine. But before we get too excited about the prospect of fully automated luxury communism, we need to consider the ethical implications of AI. Are we creating a dystopian future or just a more convenient one? Aaron, my first question for you. Who do you think wrote that intro? Michael Walker. It wasn't me. It wasn't Stephen, our um, very talented researcher. It was ChatGPT4. Um, so the instruction I gave it was to write an intro to a Navarro video in the style of Michael Walker and please make a joke about fully automated luxury communism. And that's what it came up with. Now, I think it was, it was a little bit awkward. It, you know, it wasn't as smooth as maybe I would have written it, um, but it wasn't half bad. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's got a future. Um, let's take a look at the promo video from OpenAI. Um, the background here, ChatGPT4 came out this week. Lots of people very excited about it. This is the promo. GPT4 takes what you prompt it with and just runs with it. From one perspective, it's a tool, a thing you can use to get useful tasks done in language. From another perspective, it's a system that can make dreams, thoughts, ideas flourish in text in front of you. GPT-4 is incredibly advanced and sophisticated. It can take in and generate up to 25,000 words of text, around eight times more than ChatGPT. It understands images and can express logical ideas about them. For example, it can tell us that if the strings in this image were cut, the balloons would fly away. This is the place where you just get turbocharged by these AIs. They're not perfect, they make mistakes, and so you really need to make sure that you know the work is being done to your level of expectation. But I think that it is fundamentally about amplifying what every person is able to do. GPT-4 training finished last August, and everything that's been happening in the past few months up until we've released it has been a giant sprint to make it safer, more aligned, and also more useful. We have put in already a lot of internal guardrails around things like adversarial usage, unwanted content, and privacy concerns. And when we release a model, we know things are not done. We know we have to learn. We know we have to update. We know we have to keep improving all the systems around it to make it suitable for society. To me, the most compelling use cases of these technologies will come from starting with a real human need. The obvious one where these systems have really incredible potential is in education. GPT-4 can teach a huge range of subjects. Imagine giving a fifth grader a personal math tutor with unlimited time and patience. It's a great tool to bring learning to everyone in a way that is personalized to their skill level. GPT-4 brings the dream of having the most useful, helpful assistant to life. It's really about adding as much value to everyday life as possible. So that's the team at OpenAI's sort of explanation of chat GPT-4. As the author of Fully Automated Luxury Communism, Aaron, this is more your beat than it is mine. How big a deal is the release of chat GPT-4? Well, not that big a deal. I mean, what it, what it does is it, it's, it's, it's a major moment. Chat GPT has clearly been a major moment in the unfolding story of what is machine learning. What is machine learning and why is it different from other forms of automation? Well, I did a TikTok about this and didn't do particularly well because it was posted by one of our colleagues from Australia, uh, which isn't good. And so we didn't hit the TikTok algorithm. Um, but machine learning basically is when you give a, a computer massive amounts of data and it has to uh, fulfill a certain task and it looks for for patterns. Let me give you an example. A self-driving car is about machine learning. You have a car, it's a computer on wheels, it has vision, and basically it's inputted with huge amounts of data about the kinds of things that cars do, uh, how do you respond to this particular road, obstacles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's almost like a, a, a more general kind of intelligence going on with machine learning. Now, machine learning is going to destroy lots of jobs, particularly in highly repetitive white collar jobs, think accountancy, legal services, even in medicine. Radiology is a, is a great area where you can see machine learning taking lots of people's jobs. There'll still be you know, radiographers, but the point is one radiographer with machine learning tools will be 10 times more efficient at their job than 10 radio, radiographers are at present. And I think that's how we need to understand AI with regards to labor productivity, work, and jobs. doesn't mean that whole jobs are going to disappear. doesn't mean that you know, everyone's going to be unemployed. We'll still have many of the same jobs we have today. They're not going to disappear. The point is we'll have far fewer of them. A great example is coding. So right now, people code. It's a job. 
and it employs many, many people. And of course, you have junior coders, entry-level positions in the industry, and you, you go right the way to the top, right? You have more experience, professionals earn money, add more value. And some of the jobs you'd have for an entry-level coder, so for instance, debugging code or translating code from one coding language to another, is the sort of stuff that you could automate very soon, right? So all of a sudden, what that means is we still have coders. It's not all been automated, but there are fewer positions available. Um, and we see a massive rise in productivity because the remaining coders are equipped with really powerful artificial intelligence. So it's going to do a couple of things. It's going to, like I say, mean fewer jobs in many industries, particularly white collar industries where people have presumed job security for life, think accountancy. And it's also probably going to increase to even more um, economic inequality, both within and between countries. Why? Because the number of uniquely human jobs begins to contract. Um, and jobs that you know can't be automated using machine learning, think care work, think cleaners, think things that require fine motor coordination, but we refer to as unskilled. Well, those jobs still remain. In the, in, the, in the case of care work, actually, those jobs will grow because we're an aging population. So you have fewer people can become accountants, work in legal services, work in even retail. A lot of that can be automated with machine learning. And more and more people go into the remaining sectors, which employ lots of people. What does that mean? When you have a large amount of people go into a new sector, um, you know, demand is broadly the same. You have more labor supply. Well, of course, that means the price that labor can ask for, their wages, goes down. So it's, it's going to lead to further inequality. This is in a great book called The Second Machine Age. I won't say the authors because one is Icelandic. And his name is very difficult to pronounce, but it's cited in my book too. So even if you don't think it's the rise of the robots, all the jobs are going to disappear, um, there are still massive social, economic, and political implications, massive economic inequality, probably way more than what we've seen right now. Let me finish with this. The analogy would be the steam engine, right? So imagine if you have China and the US, which by the way, are the only two countries who are serious when it comes to AI, although the US is trying to hobble China now through starving it of microprocessors. Um, there was a report, I think it was by PricewaterhouseCooper, which said that 70% of, um, of the value created by AI before 2030, 2035, I think it was about 15, 16, 17 trillion. PricewaterhouseCooper said 70% of that goes to the US and China. This is the equivalent of the steam engine and the value it creates at the, at the turn of the 19th century and overwhelmingly, of course, the dividend of that goes to the United Kingdom, which temporarily was this global mega power. So if we already think of China and the US as very powerful entities, okay, let's see what happens with regards to AI in the next 20, 30 years. Now, this is so important. It's precisely why we're seeing this unfolding chips war between the US and China. The subtext to all of that is AI. Because if you master AI, you're going to master the, the, the most valuable economic applications in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Of course, if you want, you know, mixed market economy, you want big, powerful, wealthy companies, but also if you want the leading, most innovative military innovations of the next 10, 20, 30 years, you also need AI. So if you want to be the, the global superpower with military capabilities, with large, powerful economy, you also need to be a technological leader. And to be the technological leader, like I say, for the next several decades, you need to be leading in AI. The US wants to stop that by starving China of microprocessors through these sanctions. It's also investing, I think, about $50 billion in its domestic microprocessor industry. China is investing $150 billion because, of course, it's starting from a, uh, it's further back compared to the US. The reason why they're doing all that is because AI is so, so important. Meanwhile, here in Europe, look, Michael, in Britain, we can't even build cycle lanes. So that's going to tell you something about the geopolitics of all this over the next 40, 50 years. Now, I'm feeling a little bit insecure because I started this section with a script written by ChatGPT. And actually, a lot of people in the comments are saying it wasn't half bad. Now, I don't want to just become a glorified auto cue reader and have ChatGPT write the whole show. All right? So I do want to keep my job. And I'm going to try and convince you um, that ChatGPT can't do it. Um, so it doesn't always hit the nail on the head. So last night, I asked it this. Tell a joke that might appeal to the Navarra Media audience. And it came up with this. 
Why did the socialist cat refuse to catch the mice? Because they believed in the equal distribution of whiskers. And then chuckles. But seriously, folks, we at Navarra Media are always up for a good laugh while discussing the important issues of our time. So that was ChatGBT's suggestion. Um, and I asked it for an explanation. I said, I don't actually really get that joke. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you explain? And ChatGPT says, I apologize if the joke wasn't clear. It was a lighthearted attempt at combining the theme of socialism with the behavior of cats. Let me break it down for you. In the joke, we have a socialist cat. Socialism is an economic and political system that advocates for the equal distribution of wealth and resources among the people. The punchline is that the cat refuses to catch the mice because they believe in the equal distribution of whiskers. Here, whiskers is a playful substitution for wealth or resources. The joke is meant to be funny because it's absurd for a cat to be concerned with socialism and the equal distribution of whiskers. The aim was to create a lighthearted moment for the Navarra media audience who were generally interested in politics and social issues while keeping the tone fun and engaging. Now, the problem there for me, Aaron, I, can, I, I got why they'd said the equal distribution of whiskers, but why would that stop a cat from catching the mouse? No, something's, there's a bug. See, we're gonna there's, there's a bug in chat. We're gonna, no, 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 no. We're going to disagree. This is actually a sign of intelligence. Making a bad joke and then explaining it is a sign of intelligence. It could scan for good jokes, which are very funny. Making a very poor joke on the basis of data you've inputted and then explaining what the joke actually means is very, very smart. I know this sounds dumb, but it is true. You know, there's also a, there was a photo, probably people are familiar with this. You know, there's a meme of like, you know, chicken, breaded chicken nuggets. And it's like a map of the world. And it's like, oh, the world is so beautiful. And somebody fed this meme to chat GPT-4 and it explained what it really was and why it's a meme and why it's, and it's basically like an absurdist meme and it's kind of stupid. The, the idea that you almost engage in the explanation and understanding of something which is absurd, wow, Michael, for a machine to be doing that's really, really incredible. Mm -hmm.